Um, it gives me great pleasure in um, introducing Donald Fraser back again. He did a wonderful presentation in October, um, again about the Gilded Age, but it was about servants in the, the Gilded Age. And that was lots of fun, lots of information. Today, Donald is going to present to you scandals in the Gilded Age. So I can't wait to hear what kind of scandals these people got up to. Um, Don Fraser is a personal friend. He and I go back many, many years where we used to work together doing a Scottish Celtic day at Mills Mansion. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. But I love when we do things together. So um, Don is the educator at Mills Mansion. And he does all sorts of great programs from second grade through college. And also many of these kind of presentations. So I'm hoping that after this one, there's more to come. So, big round of applause for Don Fraser. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shirley. I'll just uh, say a word of housekeeping to start with. We're at a, a walkway here. My talk happens to be a series of stories, so I won't be offended if people hear some stories and then they get up and walk, and I'm sure other walkers will come in uh, so my feelings won't be hurt. Well, as Shirley said, I work at Statsburg, the Mills Mansion. Probably some of you have been. And you know, if you tour the mansion, you hear a great story of the owner of the mansion at the turn of the century, Ruth Livingston Mills, and her ambitions to be the queen of Gilded Age society. But a few years ago, we thought, well, we need different kinds of stories. We need to bring people back. And so we started to do uh, what we call theme tours. We tell the story in different ways. And seasonally, we'll do different kinds of stories. For example, the Millses had tickets for the Titanic. Every spring, we do a special Titanic tour that compares what you see on the, in the mansion to what you would have seen on the Titanic. Maybe some of you have seen Downton Abbey. So we do a special Downton Abbey tour, which we've just updated to include the HBO series, The Gilded Age, and we haven't seen the movie yet. Anybody seen the new Downton Abbey movie? All right. I'm at work all the time. I don't get out to see the movies, but I got to go see that pretty soon. So one of the uh, other tours we do is Gilded Age Scandals, and I'm going to give you a taste of that tour, how we presented uh, in the mansion today. Uh, so, Gilded Age scandals. In the Gilded Age, in the period of time from about the end of the Civil War, about 1865, to the beginning of World War I in Europe in 1914, that's the era that scholars call the Gilded Age. Well, in the Gilded Age, all that glittered, most assuredly, was not gold. It was Mark Twain, the great cynic of the time, who first called it the Gilded Age. I think he was saying, it's not a golden age. It's a Gilded Age. The, the gold's on the outside, like a gilded picture frame. You know, it looks like solid gold, but if you scratch it, it's just wood underneath. And I think Mark Twain was saying, it looks so good on the outside, but look deeper, and what do you see? And there were many positive things in the Gilded Age. Uh, there were all the fantastic inventions at the turn of the century, from the telephone to the telegraph to the moving picture, the automobile, the airplane. It was the same era when the Transcontinental Railroad was built and America became a, a continental power. And indeed, the same era when America became a world power. And of course, there were all the beautiful mansions that the millionaires built. But what happened if you look deeper? What did you see in the Gilded Age? Well, you saw millions of Americans living in conditions of unbelievably squalid poverty. And there was a culture of political corruption that stank to the high heavens. And there was also a fair amount of very naughty behavior among the rich and famous. Now, I, I hasten to say that Ruth Livingston Mills, the owner of Statsburg, she and her husband were models of good behavior. No hint of scandal ever touched their name. 
They gave lots of money to charity. Their children loved them. The Millses loved dogs. Ruth Mills lived up to the ideal that women like her were taught when they were young, when they went to finishing school. They were taught one should have one's name in the newspaper only when one is born, when one gets married, and when one dies at no other time. And Ruth Mills tried to live up to that. Her friends, nah, not so much, which is a good thing because if her friends hadn't got their names in the newspaper, I wouldn't have any juicy stories to tell you today. Now, King Edward set the tone for the Gilded Age, also sometimes called the Edwardian Age. You know, his mother, Queen Victoria, certainly set the tone for the prim and proper Victorian age. Uh, Victoria was famous for saying, we are not amused. But her son liked his amusement. He liked to have fun. Now, King Edward was not the first royal figure alleged to have had an affair outside of his marriage. But maybe nobody since Henry VIII went at it with such gusto. In the course of his life, Edward was rumored to have had some 56 relationships outside of his marriage. Now, when you went to Statsburg for a weekend party, under the austere gaze of Ruth Livingston Mills, I think we can rest assured that there would be no scandals at Statsburg. If you were invited, you, you wouldn't bring any of the skeletons in your closet, leave them in the closet. Just prim and proper at Statsburg. Ruth Mills grew up at Statsburg. It was her family's ancestral home. And uh, when she grew up there, it was a huge 25-room mansion that her great-grandfather had built. Her great-grandfather had been the third governor of New York. A big 25-room mansion. When Ruth Mills inherited, and she wanted to be the queen of society, but 25 rooms, it's just not enough. So in 1895, she hired Stanford White, one of America's greatest architects, to enhance her childhood home. And when Stanford White was finished in 1896, the house had expanded from 25 rooms to 79 rooms. And that's the house that, that we tour today, 79 rooms. Stanford White, what a great place to start with Gilded Age scandals. Now, if Stanley White was a great architect, he was not a model citizen. Stanford White built the first Madison Square Garden in New York. And uh, nearby Madison Square Garden, he had a secret apartment, secret at least from his wife, where he threw stag parties for the rich elite gentlemen of the Gilded Age. Mark Twain himself attended one of Stanford White's parties. And he entertained underage showgirls. Now, those of us of a certain age will remember the O.J. Simpson trial. It was called the trial of the century. Well, the first trial of the century, the first trial of the 20th century, trial of the century, was the trial of the jealous husband who killed Stanford White. Here's the newspaper headline. Harry Thaw kills Stanford White on roof garden. Harry Thaw was a Pittsburgh millionaire who was married to the beautiful Evelyn Nesbitt. And Evelyn Nesbitt told her husband that when she was a young underage showgirl in New York City, Stanford White had invited her to his apartment and he drugged her drink. When she awoke, she was in bed with Stanford White. In the Gilded Age, you would have said she was a ruined woman. Well, Harry Thaw, her husband, couldn't get over this story 
that his wife told him what had happened when she was a uh, 17 year old showgirl. And he started to stalk Harry Thor. And he caught up with Harry Thor. Harry Thor started to stalk Stanford White. And he caught up with him at Madison Square Garden, the building that Stanford White had built. There was a rooftop cafe at Madison Square Garden. And Stanford White, the architect, was sitting in the cafe taking in a show. This is a photograph of that cafe. And you can see the stage where they would have the shows. Harry Thor walked up to Stanford White in a crowd like this. And he shot him in the face and killed him. Harry Thor was arrested on the spot. He was tried for murder. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. And so the jury found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was incarcerated at an institution for the criminally insane called Matawan. It's right down the road in Fishkill. It's now part of the Beacon Correctional Institute. Uh, and at Matawan, Rich Harry lived in luxury. There he is dining in fine linen. Yes. Crystal pitcher right in front of him here. Uh, the family limo used to come and take him for weekend outings. You know, he's not in jail, he's in an institution. And in the years that I've been doing this talk, once in a while, I, I think twice, I had people from Fishkill at the talk, and they said, our parents told us about the limo. You know, imagine Fishkill in the early 20th century, some big limo tooling around. So the family money kept him in comfort, and eventually the family money got him sprung from Matawan, and, he, and the family money just barely kept him ahead of the law for the rest of his life. Now, with that introduction, let's go through the mansion and see what we find. I start the Gilded Age Scandals tour at Ruth Livingston Mill's fabulous bedroom. I think it's one of the great rooms in the Hudson Valley. It really has to be seen to be believed. Now, looking at this wonderful marital bedroom at Statsburg might bring thoughts of wedded bliss in the Gilded Age. Wedded bliss, well, not if you had the misfortune to marry Harry Lair. Harry Lair was a famous person in the Gilded Age. Harry Lair was celebrated as the court jester of Gilded Age society. He was so funny and so witty that he became famous and he was a fixture in Gilded Age society parties. Um, folks might know about Jay Gould. Uh, he has this fabulous mansion down in Terrytown, uh, Lyndhurst. He was a famous Gilded Age robber baron. Uh, Jay Gould's daughter-in-law, Edith Gould, said of Harry Lair, you can't give a party without him. He goes everywhere, though he has no money of his own. The men don't seem to like him. When Harry Lair was a young man, he's climbing society's ladder. He's got wit, he's got charm. Some of the high-powered society hostesses took him in under their wing because they knew if Harry Lair was at their party, the party was going to be a success. He's so funny. So here's Harry Lear. He's climbing society's ladder. He's got connections with some of these high-powered hostesses. He's got wit. He's got charm. He's got everything he needs except money. Enter Elizabeth Drexel. As a young woman, she was heiress to the fabulous Drexel banking fortune that gave us Drexel University. And as a young woman, sadly, she was already a young widow. She married young, and her husband died very young when they were in their 20s. Elizabeth Drexel, loaded, lonely. Harry Lair turns on a charm offensive, and he won her heart, and they got married. And this, in fact, is the wedding portrait. That's the day they got married. Now, 
They go off on their honeymoon, they go to the honeymoon hotel, and in the style of the times, what you do if, if you're rich in the Gilded Age is when you're in a hotel, you stay in a very fancy hotel, and you have adjoining suites. You need lots of room. You have tons and tons of luggage, plus you're traveling with your personal servants. Uh, so they get, have interconnecting suites, her suite and his suite. It's going to be their first night together as a married couple. Elizabeth wants everything to be perfect. She arranges to have dinner for the two of them in her suite. It's going to be their first dinner together as a married couple. She has her suite filled with crimson roses. It's Harry's favorite flower. She orders Harry's favorite meal, quails in aspic. She orders Harry's favorite brand of champagne. She has a table set for two, and there in the little romantic table set for two, on Harry's plate, she lays the special wedding gift that she got for her new husband, a beautiful gold and enamel pocket watch. And she puts it on Harry's plate, and she sits down, and she waits for Harry to enter. And she waits. And she waits. Finally, her maid comes in, blushing furiously, and she says, Mr. Lair is having dinner in his suite. A crushed Elizabeth sat there by herself until Harry Lair finally deigned to make an appearance, whereupon he announced he didn't love her, he only married her for her money. The only woman I could ever love, he tells her, is my mother. He tells her that they'll have a good life together with her money and his society connections. They'll go far in society. He says he'll treat her with respect in public, but in private, he asks that she stay away from him, or he will be forced to admit the brutal truth that he finds her repulsive. This from the court jester of the Gilded Age. Well, history is full of one disastrous Gilded Age society marriage after another. But at Statsburg, at the Mills' place, there were happy marriages. The Mills' daughters married well. This is a photo of the Mills' daughter, Lavis. Gladys married Henry Carnegie Fitz. His father was Andrew Carnegie's business partner in the Pittsburgh steel business. So money married lots and lots of money. And you know, I use this picture. It's not a picture when they were young and married. It's a picture when they're an older married couple. Don't they look like maybe they're still in love? I love that picture. And Gladys had a twin sister, Beatrice, who also married well. Uh, Beatrice, like scores and scores of American heiresses, married into European aristocracy. These Gilded Age society climbing heiresses wanted a title. And the impoverished aristocrats who'd inherited these vast mansions, well, they needed an infusion of cash. And I'm telling you, scores of American women they were called dollar princesses, married into the European aristocracy. The Mills' daughter, Beatrice, married King Edward's master of horse. She became Lady Granard, and she moved to a castle in Ireland. Uh, now, this formidable looking woman is Ava Vanderbilt. She was one of Ruth Livingston Mills' rivals to be queen of society. Well. You know, she might look at Ruth Mills and say, oh, well, your daughter married an earl. My daughter married a duke. Ava Vanderbilt forced her very unwilling daughter, Consuelo, to marry the Duke of Marlborough. Well, the Duke lived in a palace, and he desperately needed money to fix up the palace. Consuelo was in love with somebody else. The Duke was in love with somebody else. 
money talked. They got married and $2.5 million of Vanderbilt Railroad stock changed hands. The Palace of Blenheim needed a lot of money. The Duke's father had also married an American heiress. The Duke's uncle married an American heiress named Jenny Jerome. There she is with her two sons. Anybody recognize her older son on the right who, half American, grew up to be one of the most famous personages of the 20th century? Half American, Winston Churchill, he was the son of an American dollar princess. Now going through Statsburg, we go to the drawing room. You know, drawing room's not a place where people went to draw. It was the withdrawing room. In the custom of the day, after dinner, the men and women would separate. The women would leave the dining room and they would withdraw to the drawing room and then the men were free to stay in the dining room, light up the cigars, drink brandy. Now that the women are gone, the men can talk about politics and business, which would not be considered polite talk over the dining room table. Uh, the women in the drawing room might be constrained by these very conservative Gilded Age ideas of what was proper for women to talk about. You know, educated, talented, powerful, well-traveled women might be taught when they're young in finishing school, oh, keep the conversation polite when you go to the drawing room. Uh, you can talk about dressmakers and debutantes. Oh, but not this lady. That's Alice Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt's eldest daughter. In the Gilded Age, she was called Princess Alice. When Teddy Roosevelt was president, Alice Roosevelt was young and single. The newspapers loved her. She was great copy. She was good friends with the Mills' twin daughters. So if you were invited to a party at Statsburg, the president's daughter might well be there. And she was a pistol. I imagine her in the drawing room just tweaking Ruth Mills, just expanding the limits of what women were supposed to do and what women were supposed to talk about. Uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt sent her on a diplomatic trip where she jumped into a swimming pool fully clothed, you know. The president's daughter wasn't supposed to do those kind of things at the turn of the century. She used to travel with her pet snake, little green garter snake that she called Emily Spinach. You know, so imagine, like, if you were the new maid at Statsburg, you're the newbie, you'd have to unpack her luggage. You know, watch out for the snake. Uh, now, she became a famous Washington hostess when she was an adult. Um, and she lived, oh, into the 70s, I think. Um, and she had a famous expression. Does anybody know Alice's, Alice Roosevelt Longworth's famous expression when she was a hostess? Uh, she used to say, if you can't say anything nice about people, come and sit by me. <laughs> And Teddy Roosevelt used to say, and people would say, Mr. President, you have to do something about Alice. And Teddy Roosevelt used to say, I can be President of the United States or I can control Alice. I cannot do both. <laughs> now, when Teddy Roosevelt was President, Alice got engaged to up and coming young Congressman Nick Longworth from Ohio. And when I say up and coming, he was going to go on to be Speaker of the House. He, he was a serious power broker. The newspapers loved it. Can you imagine better copy than this? President's daughter to marry up and coming congressman. And sure enough, they did get married at the White House. There they are, Nick Longworth and Alice Roosevelt on their wedding day with proud papa, the President of the United States. Oh, oh I forgot. I'm not here to tell you nice stories. I'm here to tell you that all that glitters isn't gold. It looks so good on the outside. Well, apparently it wasn't a very happy marriage. They had a daughter, but it was an open secret in Washington that Nick was not 
the father of the daughter. Uh, Senator William Bora of Idaho was the father of the daughter. Mick himself was famous for his affairs. Uh, a woman wrote in a memoir that she attended a high-powered Washington party and she went upstairs to use the bathroom. She opened the bathroom door. Nick was in the bathroom. Nick was not alone in the bathroom. But these aren't the kind of proper stories we should be telling in the drawing room. I'm surprised at you. We should move on. So I take the tour into the Mills' grand reception hall. And in this room, Ruth Mills is putting on the dog. She is trying to say, with this room, I am, I am an American aristocrat. And it's got this signature things that you'd see in a European aristocrat's house. So notice the grand staircase. That's where the ladies come down and they make an entrance in their beautiful gowns. And above the staircase, there's a huge Belgian tapestry from the 1700s, exactly the kind of thing that you'd see in a European castle. And as you're coming down the staircase, you're facing a long row of Ruth Mill's ancestral portraits. You know, she's putting it on. She's saying, Mrs. Astor, Mrs. Vanderbilt, take this. Try to live up to this if you can. And among the ancestral portraits is a portrait of her great-grandfather, Morgan Lewis, who built the first Statsburg and became third governor of New York. So she's bragging, you know. Now, when Ruth Mills expanded her house in 1895, another former governor of New York was president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. And in an age of political scandal, Grover Cleveland stood out like a sore thumb as a reformer. He seemed to have this peculiar idea that politicians should be role models. And maybe he was a little sanctimonious about it because both his enemies and his friends referred to him as Grover the Good. Now, when Grover the Good was first running for president, just imagine the delight of his opponents when they discovered that Grover the Good was secretly making child support payments for an illegitimate child. This is good campaign fodder. Right? Cleveland's opponents started to show up at Cleveland rallies. And they would stand together and they would chant in unison, Ma, Ma, where's my Pa? Ma, Ma, where's my Pa? And here's an editorial cartoon of the day. <laughs> the baby's saying, I want my Pa. And Grover Cleveland has a little tag on his coat that says, Grover the Good. <laughs> well, Grover Cleveland met with his advisors and he said, we're going to tell the truth. And the truth was that Grover Cleveland, who was an unmarried man, had had an affair with an unmarried woman. And she had a baby. And Cleveland said, at the time, she was involved with several men. Nobody was sure who the father was. But of the men that she was involved with, Cleveland said, I was the only unmarried man. So I agreed to take responsibility for the baby. And he made the child support payments. I guess the married guys would have had trouble explaining to their wives what that monthly check was for. Right? Uh, so Cleveland uh, said that he would make the child support payments. And this is the story they told the public. Surprisingly, the public seemed to enjoy hearing the truth, and Grover Cleveland was elected president. Now think about this for a minute. A politician is caught in a sex scandal. He takes responsibility, and he tells the truth. I, I don't know about you, but this just doesn't sound familiar to me. <laughs> Mark Twain used to say, we had the best government that money can buy. <laughs> well, the grand staircase leads to bedrooms of stairs. So if you're coming to visit the Millses for the day, uh, you'll go up the stairs and change for dinner. And of course, if you're coming for the weekend, you'll get assigned a room upstairs uh, and you'll, you'll stay for the weekend.
the bedrooms upstairs are, are very lavish. You know, the, all the rooms are masterpieces of design. Now, these house parties at country houses were the thing in society in the Gilded Age, not just in the States, but also in England. Here's King Edward dressed for the country. As he traveled around his realm, he loved to go to parties. He was a party boy. And, you know, if you were a hostess in England, there could be no greater honor than to have the king attend one of your parties. And if the king attended one of your parties, the custom was that at the end of the party, everyone would go outside and you'd have a photograph taken with the king, which would document forever the honor that the king had bestowed on your country house. And I use this photograph for a specific reason. You might think I'm going far afield. Here we're talking about Statsburg and Ruth Mills. Now I'm jumping off to England. Don't think they weren't connected. Ruth's daughter married King Edward's master of horse. Ruth's, um, uh, Ruth's brother-in-law was the ambassador to England. And this is a party at the ambassador to England's house in England. And the red arrow shows the king. And who's that under the blue arrow in a veil? It's Ruth Livingston Mills. So Ruth Mills was hanging out with the king. Now, oh, here's it. And what, what year was this now? Like, what year was that? Oh, been? you caught me on that one. It's, it's about 1905. Okay. Yeah. I think when I was younger, I knew dates like that. <laughs> I'm just impressed with the clarity of the black and white. Isn't that amazing? I used to do it, and this, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, once in a while, we run in these turn-of-the-century photographs uh, of extraordinary um, clarity. And you know, another modern phenomenon is that you can find out things that have been unknown for years. So who's everybody in the photograph? Well, we knew a few people. And we could find other people through research. And some more members of Ruth's family are in the photograph. But about two years ago, one of my co-workers found a turn-of-the-century article in a Washington State newspaper that identified every single person in the photo. So yeah, that's the king with the red arrow and Ruth Mills with the blue arrow. Uh, now. Uh, <laughs> Somebody in the know is saying, oh, Alice Keppel. If you're a Gilded Age hostess and the king is going to do you the honor of coming to your house, you want the king to be happy, don't you? Well, if you want the king to be happy, maybe you'll invite Mrs. Alice Keppel. And maybe you'll forget to invite Mr. Keppel. Uh, you know, I, I had mentioned that the king allegedly had some 56 affairs, but Mrs. Keppel was special. And, you know, the English had this sort of broad-minded attitude about affairs after marriage, at least among the wealthy. They weren't, they didn't have the puritanical background of the Americans. They kicked the Puritans out to the new country. Uh, so when at the end of his life, King Edward lay dying at Buckingham Palace, Mrs. Keppel was allowed to come and pay her final respects. But, you know, there's a limit even to English broad-mindedness. There was a famous party incident in the Gilded Age that uh, sort of challenged the idea of English broad-mindedness. Uh, you know, at these country parties, there was tennis and there was horseback riding and there were extramarital affairs. It was like another sport at the, at the Gilded Age parties. So everybody would go to their rooms and, uh, you know, like the honeymoon hotel I described to the Lairs, the man would have a room, and the, the woman would have a room. Husband and wife would have adjoining rooms. So they're kind of free to sneak out. And there was a lot of that. So there was a famous party incident in the Gilded Age in England where uh, the lights go out, and people start tiptoeing around in the darkened quarters. And Lord so-and-so had made a date with his lover. And so he tiptoes down the hall in the dark and quietly opens her room and he tiptoes across the room, and he jumps into bed with her. Oops, wrong room. 
He jumped into bed with the Bishop of, Ig bishop of England. <coughs> and uh, the bishop, as Queen Victoria might have said, was not amused. <laughs> So after that, hostesses in the know put the guest names on the doors. Uh, well, after discussing scandals upstairs, I bring the tour back down the grand staircase to the reception hall. And there's a story I tell in the reception hall in front of the beautiful fireplace in the reception hall. The story involves this man, James Gordon Bennett, a famous eccentric of the Gilded Age. He was the editor of the New York Herald in the days when starting a newspaper could make you a vast fortune. His father started the New York Herald and became fabulously wealthy. His father sadly died at a young age. James Gordon Bennett inherited at a very young age, so in his 20s, he was suddenly fabulously wealthy. James Gordon Bennett was engaged to marry Fifth Avenue socialite Caroline May. And my story about Caroline May and James Gordon Bennett involves a tradition in old New York. Here's the tradition. Now in old New York, on Fifth Avenue, at the turn of the century, the millionaires had a New Year's Day practice. You'd have open house all up and down Fifth Avenue. And you'd get into your carriage, you'd go to your neighbor's mansion, and you'd go in, you'd, you'd bid a happy new year to your neighbors, and then you'd have a warming drink in front of the fireplace, and then you'd get back into your carriage and go to the next mansion and repeat the performance. And the, the title of the etching is uh, New Year's Day in Old New York. And you see the fireplace there where you could warm up uh, before getting back into your carriage. And all of society gathered around. Well, here's James Gordon Bennett. He's engaged to Caroline May. And uh, come New Year's Day, he's going to go pay his respects to his fiance and her parents. And uh, he shows up at the May's mansion. Now, unfortunately, it seems that he had probably paid a few other calls before he got to the May's mansion perhaps had a few too many warming drinks in front of the fireplace before he got to the May Mansion. When he got to the May Mansion, he was stone-faced drunk. He was blotto. He was bombed. He stumbled into the May Mansion, elbowing aside the members of polite society, he stumbled over to the fireplace, picture a scene like this, and in front of all of elite Gilded Age New York society, he proceeded to urinate in the fireplace. <laughs> the next day, Caroline May's brother horsewhipped James Gordon Bennett on the streets of Manhattan. And to say the least, the engagement was off. James Gordon Bennett moved to Paris, and he didn't try to get married again until he was in his 70s. <laughs> That's like the original pub crawl. That's the original pub crawl. Oh, right. It's like spring break. Yeah, bring all the guests to each bar. Right. That's the original pub crawl. Bar to bar, or you know, Fifth Avenue mansion to Fifth. Hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Well, when you're coming to Statsburg for a weekend party, you know, you go upstairs to change, and then you come down to the dining room. It's the main event. Uh, the Milfis dining room is another room that you really have to see to conceive how grand it is. Uh, and this is what these Gilded Age millionaires did. They threw these fabulous parties. They had these very formal dinners. Everybody dressed to the nines, you know, gentlemen in white tie and tails, ladies in gowns from Paris, the tiara, the works. And you, you can imagine at Statsburg that everything under Ruth Livingston Mills' gaze, everything very formal, very proper. Believe me, everybody knows which fork to use. But uh, it, it didn't always work out to be a setting of, of proper and dignified behavior. Uh, there was a Gilded Age millionaire named C.K. 
K.G. Billings, who was a, he was a big horse guy. And he built himself new stables in Manhattan. He was so happy with how the stables came out, he threw a party for all his friends at the elite restaurant in New York, Sherry's. And the dinner was on horseback. Invited all his friends and provided horses. And they had dinner on horseback in the ballroom at Sherry's. The ballroom was on the second floor. They had to bring the horses up in the elevator. Right? So there were trays fixed to the saddles and champagne buckets on the saddles. And so everybody ate dinner, mounted horseback. The waiters were dressed like grooms. And then there were real grooms standing behind the horses with shovels. <laughs> Mamie Fish was uh, another one of Ruth Livingston Mill's rivals to be queen of society. Uh, Mamie had an offbeat sense of humor. And you can imagine who her favorite friend was. Harry Lair, the Gilded Age jester, the guy who jilted his wife on their wedding day. So they were always cooking up these crazy ideas in what were supposed to be formal dinners. Uh, so uh, Mamie and Harry cooked up this idea for a formal dinner at uh, Harry Lair's place. And they sent out invitations, and they got the uh, rumor mill going. Invitations were to meet a new aristocrat, someone nobody had ever met before, Prince Del Drago, on his first visit to the United States. So he's new meat. Everybody wants to meet the new prince. And then the rumor mill starts. Oh, he's very nice. You'll like him. Don't give him too much to drink, or he'll get wild. So, of course, everybody wants to come and see him have too much to drink, right? So, I mean, the, the night of the party comes, everybody's gathered, everybody's all at Twitter, they can't wait to meet Prince Del Drago, and finally the butler throws open the door and he announces, Harry Lair and Prince Del Drago. Harry Lair and Prince Del Drago walk in arm in arm. Prince Del Drago was a chimpanzee, <laughs> faultlessly dressed in white tie and tails, as the guest of honor, he sat at Mrs. Lair's right. Mrs. Lair is the hostess. Uh, Mrs. Lair later commented that she had met many European princes, and compared to them, Prince Del Drago's manners were actually quite good. Uh, Mamie. Mamie was famous for her sharp tongue. You remember Ava Vanderbilt? She married off her unwilling daughter, Consuelo, to the Duke of Marlborough. Ava Vanderbilt once confronted Mamie Fish, and she said, I heard you said I look like a frog. Yes. And Mamie said, oh, no, pet, not a frog, a toad. <laughs> Here's another picture of Mamie. She's the lady on the right. They're at a costume ball. And I was really excited when I found this picture. Uh, see the tall fellow uh, with the white hair and mustache in the center? That's Stanford White, Ruth Livingston Mills' architect. And when I first found the picture, the gentleman sitting on the left with his legs crossed was misidentified as Harry Lair. So when I, I got the picture, I said, oh, I got all my usual suspects in one picture. Uh, but later I found out it wasn't Harry Lair. So I, I owe you another picture of Harry Lair. There's Harry, the life of the party. He, uh, I mean, there were clubs like that. Yeah, the comment for folks in the back was saying there were clubs for cross-dressers at the turn of the century. Um, in Harry's diary, which his wife found after he was dead, he, he spoke actually very movingly at how he longed to always dress in women's clothing how much more beautiful they were. And Gilded Age uh, rich women, when they went shopping, if they could, they would take Harry with them because he would pick out what really looked good. Who was the other president that was a cross-dresser? Oh, I think there was, a, there was a governor in New York, a British governor in New York who was a cross-dresser before the revolution. And I'm not thinking of a president, but you're thinking of somebody. Yeah, I'm thinking of Oh. Hoover was a... Yeah, there were a lot of like... Oh. <laughs> uh, That's what Google's for. 
I, I love doing these talks. Does he have a presidential library? We'll find out. FBI. FBI. Oh, FBI Hoover. Oh, 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 oh. He was, he was, he was a I love doing these talks because I always learn something. I always learn something. Well. No, you know, um, uh, you know, for this talk, uh, I use him, you know, to some extent for comic effect, but I think he was a tortured individual, you know. Uh, he couldn't come out. Uh, there's another side of the story, which I hope to tell sometime in a different kind of, uh, in a different kind of tour and talk. Uh, I have plans for Harry Lair. We'll be here. <laughs> so, you know, I take the tour throughout the mansion, and uh, I like to finish the tour by going downstairs into the servants' area. And I use it as an excuse to talk about how the other half lived. You know, downstairs were footmen, the men servants, and maids. Um, and you know, I don't want the talk just to be about the rich folk. And I don't want the talk just to be about the, uh, you know, the silly picadillos of the rich folk. So during the tour, when we have more time than we have today, I'll interject some serious scandals too. You know, in the tour we'll talk about the Johnstown flood, where millionaires didn't maintain a dam, and when it broke it wiped out the city of Johnstown, and 2,000 people were killed. And I talk about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, where the factory owners locked the seamstresses in. And when that factory caught on fire, they couldn't get out, and hundreds were killed. You know, downstairs, I use as an excuse to talk about how the other half lived in the Gilded Age. While the millionaires lived in these lavish mansions, millions of Americans were living in horrifying tenements. And Documentary photographers like Jacob Riss went into the tenements and took photographs of these unbelievable living conditions. I, you know, how many people are living in this one room? Every time I look at the photo, I notice another pair of feet. Uh, documentary photographers found homeless children living on the streets. Here, here they're huddled together like puppies over a heat grate trying to stay warm. You know, the, the picture is 100 years old. It breaks your heart today. Now, the lucky kids, well, the lucky kids got jobs. Lucky if they didn't fall into the machinery and lose an arm or a, a leg or lose their lives. And here, this, this girl, well, maybe after a few years of working in the textile mill, she'll be able to afford shoes. When I was putting together the talk for the first time, I got this far, I said, okay, I brought the tour all the way through the mansion, we're downstairs. I can't end it on this note. I can't send people out depressed. I need a happy scandal. It's told by Mrs. Harry Lair, Elizabeth Drexel, the woman who married Harry Lair and got jilted on their wedding night. She wrote a memoir late in life about her time in the Gilded Age, and she tells this story. Now. She's telling the story as best she remembers it. She doesn't get every fact right. She's not a historian. You know, she's, she's just telling what she remembers. The setting of the story is this house. It's the Pembroke Jones Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island. And the story involves a woman named Mary Lilly. And Mrs. Lair, our author, says that Mary Lilly lived upstairs in the Pembroke Jones Mansion. She never comes out and says it directly, but she kind of implies that Mary Lilly was a lady's maid. She says she lives upstairs in the Jones Mansion and she sews. She sews all day long. Mrs. Lair describes her as in her 30s, never married, very quiet, very mousy. She sews. And sometimes there are balls at the Pembroke Jones Mansion and Mary Lilly from upstairs will peer over the banister at all the glitter and gold. And maybe Mrs. Jones is wearing a dress that Mary Lilly worked on. But it's a life that Mary Lilly will never know. One day, 
at the Pembroke Jones Mansion, Henry Flagler came to lunch. Mrs. Lair, our author, describes Henry. She, she calls him Poor Henry. Poor Henry was John D. Rockefeller's business partner in Standard Oil. Poor Henry opened up Florida. Uh, he built a railroad to a sleepy village called Miami and then built it right onto the Keys. When you go to Florida, there's a lot of stuff named Flagler in Florida. But uh, uh, no, Mrs. Lair said, poor Henry. He's in his 70s, he's divorced, he's disillusioned with life. He doesn't want to go to any parties, just a few quiet lunches with friends. So he, he comes to the Joneses' house in Newport, and he has lunch, and uh, Mrs. Lair says he, he sees Mary Lily there. And after lunch, they get up to go and walk in the garden. And to Mrs. Jo Mrs. Jones is the hostess, right? Uh, and to Mrs. Jones' surprise, Henry Flagler says, will Mary Lily be joining us? And she says, why no, Henry, she has far too much sewing to do. Flagler comes back the next day for lunch. He doesn't see Mary Lily. They have a nice lunch. He gets up to go. And he's, oh, uh, a button has come loose on my sleeve. I wonder if someone could sew it for me. Well, certainly, Henry. Mary Lily. Mary Lily and Henry Flagler were alone, only long enough to sew on the button. Seems to take some time to sew on the button. <laughs> the next day, Mary Lily came to her employer, Mrs. Jones, and she said, Mr. Flagler and I are to be married. He loves me, and I love him. A shocked but charmed Mrs. Jones says to Mrs. Lair, Mrs. Lair, the author who's writing this story, she says, I moved her out of the servant's quarter. I, I, I signed her a footman. I sent the yacht to New York for jewels and gowns. Now, Mary Lilly, who used to peer over the banister at a life she'd never know, well, now Mary Lily can get just about any damn thing she wants because she is about to become one of the wealthiest women in the United States of America. And here's the happy couple, Mary Lily and Henry Flagler arriving at Key West, January 22nd, 1912. And you know, if our Cinderella didn't exactly get Prince Charming, well, He's a good-looking older guy. She, let's say she didn't get a young Prince Charming. She did get the castle. <laughs> that is what Henry Flagler built for Mary Lilly in West Palm Beach. And you can go. It's the Flagler Museum in West Palm Beach. Anybody been? It's an eyeful, I can tell you. Now, here, I'm working on my Gilded Age Scandals talk for the first time. So I, I got to find a good story to end it with. Can you imagine how happy I was when I found this story? Oh, I said, I found the perfect story. You'd think I would leave it alone. It's perfect. Don't touch it. Uh, no, 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 no. I have to do more research. Now, who exactly is Henry Flagler? 15 minutes on the internet, I uncover an entire backstory to the Flagler Mary Lily story that has every element of scandal you could want in any story, from bribery to political corruption to alleged murder. And I said, oh no, I've lost my best story. And then I said, no, no, wait, wait, I can still use it. Because doesn't it make the point that I wanted to make throughout the whole Gilded Age talk, it looks so good on the outside. <laughs> and with that, I'll conclude and remind you, all that glitters is not gold. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, questions I might answer. Please. I don't know. Uh, built in the early 20th century, uh, I, I went, I've toured it once, and I can tell you it's the kind of place where you can't, you barely get a start touring it once. 
my mother-in-law and I were in a room and we said, if, if we could only find a guard, there was a guard in the room. The room was so big, we couldn't even see him. I mean, that's a bit of it. It was dark, so we couldn't see him. I, I, I don't know. It's big. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's on the scale of the biggest mansions that I've, I've seen. Because it goes back. It does go back. The, the upstairs is unbelievable. The, the front entrance room is like a mansion by itself. But you can go. Yeah, West Palm Beach. Yes, please. I said, were they part of the Newport scene? Yeah, did they have a cottage in Newport? Yes, the Millses did have a cottage in Newport. That's where they spent this summer. You know, the millionaires built these unbelievable things. Uh, 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 Marble House, I remember reading that that cost $11 million at the turn of the century. That, that's what they called their cottage. So the Mills has also had a cottage in Newport. It's privately owned now, it's, but it's on the cliff walk where most of the mansions are. Uh, but you can't go in because it's, it's a private house. Yeah. So the question was for folks in the back, is that the same Mrs. Jones as the Hudson Valley Mrs. Jones that is allegedly the source of the expression keeping up with the Joneses? Uh, I don't think it is, but I, uh, uh, Mrs., uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a family relationship. Uh, the, the, the book was called Hudson Valley Places. Yeah, Hudson Valley Faces and Places. Um, and I got a lot of my information from some memoirs of the Gilded Age, particularly Mrs. Lair's memoir of her marriage. Uh, and also, you know, just uh, uh, general research. I worked on it for a while. Yeah. yeah. And then the deeper you, there are a hundred connected stories that I could tell you to these stories. Uh, who was Consuelo Vanderbilt in love with? That's a whole other story. And, uh, uh, you know, every story is connected to other stories, many of them with scandals. Oh, put out more about the cross-dressers. Yeah, well, I, I have, you guys can keep a secret, right? Uh, I have a secret, no, no, there's an honest person. Uh, we have, you know, we're busy running a mansion, so we have very little time to actually do research. But I have long wanted to research a talk, which I would call Gay in the Gilded Age, uh, sort of using Harry Lair as a central figure. You know, the Gilded Age society was all about exclusion. You're not in society if you're this. You're not in society if you're that. You're not in society if you're this. But Harry Lair, I mean, you have to be blind to see that he wasn't, to our interpretation, gay. Uh, and he wasn't the only one at all. It's not a story that's told. A story I think should be told. And if we ever get time to do research, we hope to move that forward. And the cross-dressing, yeah, that, the clubs, yes. But if you look on the internet, you'll see the photos of the people cross-dressing at the turn of the century. I, and I certainly don't mean to defame Mr. White. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, it was the trial of the century. It's certainly a matter of public record. And as I said, other connected stories, there's a lot of other stuff that's known about Stanford White that we won't get into. The gentleman's saying there's a famous story in the insurance industry where they, they, wouldn't, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't insure him because they thought he'd get killed by a jealous husband, and he did. And he did. <laughs> yeah. The underwriter, the guy that, that refused to write it took a lot of grief because he's paying good, he was offered to pay good money. <laughs> and within a year, he looked like a genius. Right. Everybody was coming and saying, how'd you figure out this? Oh, how funny. <laughs> oh, I, I'd love to know who that was. That's a great story. You know, there's so many stories in the Gilded Age. I, I started out, uh, the, the thing that gave me the idea to do a talk about Gilded Age scandals was, happened to be an insurance story. And it's a great story. And you can only do so much. And my first story, this insurance story, dropped out because I didn't have room for it. So I could do a bunch of, in fact, I have worked up a, a, a second Gilded Age scandals talk, starting to work it up. And there was another question. Please. I think, 
I think this is the best day of my life. <laughs> yes, I am, I am happily married only days from my 25th wedding anniversary. Is there any kind of scandal that we could get from you? About, about my marriage? <laughs> How much time do we have? And, and then we can form a line, right? We'll form a story circle. Oh, Shirley says it's time to finish. I, I'm not running away. I'll hang out. If other folks have questions or comments, you know, I'll be around. But thank you so much. It's so much fun to, to talk with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much.